Hi, everyone. Um, so thanks um, for chiming in for our third week of ECSS. Uh, today, I'm excited to introduce Dr. Karen Bailey. Dr. Bailey joins us today from uh, the Environmental Studies Department of UC Boulder. She prior to Boulder, she completed her PhD in 2018 at the School of Natural Resources and the Environment at the University of Florida. At UF, she was initially going to study small mammal communities uh, in a mosaic landscape in Swaziland, but when she got there, she evaluated her research perspective and realized her true passion was studying human environment interactions and human natural systems. This remains the focus of her research at UC Boulder. Her work literally breaks international barriers as she works with communities in Southern Africa, Sri Lanka, Thailand, Cambodia, India, Indonesia, uh, just to name a few. Uh, she has a very successful publication record that includes several recent articles on DEIJ, specifically in our EEB communities. Um, from learning about her research, it's clear to see that DEIJ is embedded in every aspect of her research program. So I'm excited to hear her speak today um, about her career and how um, she's developed it into a very um, socially conscious, socially conscious program. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, and thanks for inviting me and having me here. I'm really honored to share the, the virtual stage with Dr. Shirazi. Really enjoyed um, your talk. So today I'm going to be touching on um, this idea that's really uh, at the core of my work, which is centering our humanity. Um, and I'll discuss a little bit more about what I mean there in ecology and environmental studies and related fields to support inclusion, justice and equity and um, those sort of related principles that underlie it. Uh, this work and some of the, the research and findings and thinking uh, and conceptualization of this work is in collaboration with lots of individuals and organizations who I'd like to acknowledge at the top here. And this is not uh, the full list, there are, there are many others. So I would like to start uh, my talks with a land acknowledgement. Um, I honor and acknowledge that the University of Colorado Boulder campus, which is where I'm currently right now, is on the traditional territories and ancestral homeland of the Cheyenne, Arapaho, and Ute Nations. Further, I acknowledge the 48 contemporary tribal nations historically tied to the lands that now comprise what is called, uh, that comprise what is now called Colorado. Acknowledging that we live in the homeland of indigenous peoples recognizes the original stewards of these lands and their legacies. And with this land acknowledgement, we celebrate the many contributions of native peoples and recognize the knowledge systems indigenous peoples have developed in relationship to their lands. I further recognize and affirm the ties these nations currently have to their traditional homelands and acknowledge the painful history of oppression, marginalization, land dispossession, and forced removal that has had a profoundly negative impact on Native nations. Um, I, I think we've already sort of done a, a lot of work in this talk to establish why land acknowledgements are important. I also think it's worth noting that they are literally the bare minimum. Um, and so I, I include this, um, but I'm also thinking a lot about my research, its impacts, my positionality, what the university is doing, um, and how we're supporting Native scholars and Native communities as well. Um, so starting there. So for this talk, um, I'm going to be discussing uh, a bit about a little bit of the sort of historical context that drives my research, um, some of my actual research on inequity in STEM and natural resource fields. Um, so a lot of my research really considers the historical framework and historical positions that have led to the lack of diversity and inclusion in, in uh, STEM and natural resource fields. Um, as we've already been discussing, the history of Western science has largely been exploitative and sometimes damaging, often damaging to marginalized communities, including communities of color and indigenous communities. Uh, and a lot of those structures remain uh, when we do science today. And this can range from sort of the slightly more mundane, and I think this article, and I say mundane, but the reality is for folks who do have names that don't conform to the sort of forms that we have to fill out in our day-to-day -day lives, this becomes such significantly more than mundane. Um, so this article published in Nature uh, column really just acknowledges that some people only have one name or some people have two last names, for example. Uh, and again, these sort of soul uh, cultures and backgrounds and traditions by which we have structured systems in STEM fields make it hard to apply for grad school, apply for grants, write, write publications, et cetera. 
So it can range from sort of these um, to uh, more sort of um, systemic broad scale um, trends, uh, including particularly in, a, in ecology and related fields, the prevalence of unpaid positions that many early career, career scholars are um, expected to take in order to be successful in the field. So this figure here is um, from a recent public recent research that we just got published, looking at the relationship between unpaid positions and success in um, wildlife related fields in particular. Uh, and, and what we found from some of that work is that uh, in addition to barriers to participation for people of color, non-traditional students, those with disabilities, those with families, um, people uh, with, with less wealth, right, to take unpaid positions, but there's also some differences in the actual skills that people report gaining from unpaid positions. So ultimately we might be doing a disservice to all with the prevalence of these positions. Um, another example that I, I think is important to highlight in, uh, in, in terms of structural biases that are, are legacies in science is the reinforcement or the potential reinforcement of the invisibility of certain groups, regions, demographics, populations, in, um, and this is particularly focused on climate change research um, and, and how that has implications for climate policy. So this work shows how bias at the level of institutions where we decide to fund research and where we don't decide to fund research, for example, in research design in data collection methods in data analysis, for example, removing outliers, um, deploying a survey in one language and not providing it um, for access in other languages. Uh, can make it so that certain groups are ignored. And when we're developing um, strategies to address things like climate change and climate resilience, uh, it doesn't necessarily include those who might be especially vulnerable. Um, so these, these are just a few examples that are highlighting kind of at the highest level, um, the sum of the structures or examples of the structures that we've been researching that can lead to persistent inequity in STEM fields. So these sources of bias uh, in system and science uh, have lots of implications, but, but uh, an important one is that in general, people of color are less likely to receive degrees in STEM fields in, in this country. Um, and so this figure here shows the uh, number, total number of doctoral degrees awarded in STEM fields by race and, ethnic, race and ethnicity from 2000 to 2015. Um, and again, it's not scaled for um, population size, so it's not proportioned here, that's important to note, but it's also clear that the trends haven't changed significantly over the, the 15 years that this data was collected. And as I'm sure many uh, who are with us today also know that, that this, uh, these trends extend in particular to not only the academic realm, but also to um, practitioners and other peoples in particularly in environmental fields. And so this is some work from Dorcita Taylor and the Green 2.0 project. And I would encourage you if you're curious about this to go and look at the Green 2.0 website. Um, they're specifically focused on environmental organization, NGOs, government agencies and foundations. And they have these really, really um, uh, valuable transparency uh, report cards for these organizations that look at what they're doing and what they're not doing as it relates to um, inclusion and diversity. Um, and so this figure particularly shows how uh, the representation or the level of representation of people of color tends to decline pretty rapidly as you move from interns to staff hired in the past three years to leadership to board slots. And so obviously this, this has implications for what all of these uh, organizations prioritize in terms of research and action surrounding environmental issues. So given this lack of diversity in ecology and related fields and the experiences uh, that many um, people of color and ecologists of color face today, many of my colleagues wanted to better understand the, how the origins of environmental fields influence how we do science in ways that may lead to exclusion. So this figure here is a draft graphic from a recently accepted article that criticizes the North American model of wildlife conservation. Um, which despite the sort of many accomplishments of the model, and I you know, fully acknowledge that it has been successful in conserving wildlife in, uh, across the country and elsewhere in the world, um, many have argued that the origins of the environmental movement have created and sort of couched in, in the, this North American model have created structural and cultural barriers um, and that ultimately kind of center only one type of relationship with the environment. And so one type of perspective as it relates to conservation. 
um, and often overlooks many of the ways that um, diverse and underrepresented cultures and communities might conceptualize conservation or think about more robust and nuanced ways of having a relationship with the environment or conserving it. And so we particularly highlight the exclusion of indigenous science, um, the uh, exclusion of other types of relationships with nature, the, the tendency to disregard the narratives of, of uh, communities of color in terms of relationships with the environment um, that influences the sort of makeup of the field today. Um, these origins of the environmental movement here in the United States have also persisted and been exported to lots of other countries um, and other contexts where some of our approaches to science, ecology, and conservation uh, disenfranchise and marginalize certain communities. Things like fortress conservation, again, are separating people from their environment and excluding other ways of thinking about conservation and natural resource management. And then there's sort of the, the fraught history of traditional field science um, uh, that sort of still persists in the way we do scientific research today, where foreigners might come into communities and uh, ultimately engage in knowledge theft without benefiting local communities or considering things like data sovereign sovereignty, which Dr. Shirazi was discussing, uh, that are really important. Uh, and so there are these tensions between the way that we've engaged in science historically and this really important goal of conservation and natural and sustainable natural resource management. Um, that have include excluded certain groups and have been damaging and harmful to those groups as well. Uh, and so this figure is a particular topic of conservation refugees, which, you know, the, the term could certainly be debated, but, but looks at the reality that, that displace, this displacement and land dispossession are often at the core of some of our approaches to conservation. So given the realities of some of the origins of our field and the way that certain inequities might persist in the structures within our field, unsurprisingly, perhaps, many ecologists of color have trouble entering and persisting in these fields. And once, even, even if we are able to be recruited in these fields, once we're here, the spaces can often feel unsafe and unwelcoming. And so as part of our ongoing research with environmental scientists and conservation of color, we're doing more to learn more and to center and amplify these experiences to ultimately improve these structures. So I wanted to share with you a quote from um, a recent article we published about a student's experience, an early career student's experience conducting ecological field re research. The word was only said once, but it echoed in her ears. She heard stories of the word thrown at her, including her parents, but the word was never used towards her, the N-word. It felt like a punch to the gut. She looked around to her peers and saw blank faces. She immediately began to question her decisions regarding work. Is this my new normal? Can I survive the field season when so much pain was inflicted on the first day? She thought back to her childhood, watching Steve Irwin on television with an infectious smile and bright optimism. She dreamt of being like him, traversing the outdoors to see all of the wondrous animals. Yet Steve Irwin did not look like her, nor did her peers. So this is an important um, and you know, relatively extreme, but also definitely not uh, example from, a, again, a scientist who on, on the first day is conducting ecological field research and experiencing this, this level of, of discrimination and being surrounded by peers that um, you know, aren't stepping up, aren't, aren't supporting her, and is really making her question whether or not this is a field she wants to remain in. Um, and many people of color I know and work with have had have experienced overt and explicit racism um, and micro and macro aggressions in the field simply because they existed while doing their science. And so what we're finding through this research is that many people of color have these similar experiences linked to discrimina discrimination, isolation, ridic ridicule, and exclusion. They may not be called a racial slur, though many are, um, but it maybe it's presumed that they were hired only because of their race or that they don't have the same skills and capacity as their peers. And we're finding that often one of two things seem to happen. Either they leave and go somewhere else where they aren't likely to be the only one or where they won't be seen as just a diversity hire, for example, or they say and often feel an overwhelming burden to fix things. Um, they feel the, the need to take on the task of making the experiences for those that come after them better. And some of the people we've interviewed for this work have described feeling like a martyr for the cause of equity in STEM fields. So what can we do and how can we move forward? In the context of this, this structural racism in STEM fields in general, 
um, my soapbox and what sort of drives the title of my talk is one of bringing our humanity back into our science. And when I say humanity, I mean ourselves, our identities, and our values. So this figure here, let me show you, um, is from a recent study uh, of uh, funding, grant funding from the National Institutes of Health. And it found that black scientists were 20% less likely to receive funding from the NIH than white scientists. And that this gap was largely explained by the types of research questions pursued. Um, so figure A here shows that black scientists were more likely to propose research that focused on people, communities, populations, interventions. Um, and, and figure B shows topic clusters that didn't have applications from African American or black scientists. Um, and I think that's there's an important question there as to, to why black scientists might not be researching those questions. Um, but as it relates to sort of this discrepancy in funding, um, you know, uh, what, what we saw here from this work is that black scientists saw this humanity in their work. They sought to understand health disparities, patient focused interventions, challenges for adolescent health care. Uh, and unfortunately, consistently, review panels viewed such research as less impactful and less worthy of funding, leading to this 20% discrepancy in funding. This bias towards quote unquote impactful research that lacks explicit humanity and explicit consideration of the social, political, economic, historical processes and systems that influence health and well being. Uh, impacts the way we teach science and how science is viewed more broadly. And so as a result, people, literally people, are often less likely to be represented in textbooks, in widely shared research articles. It means that budding scientists are unlikely to see themselves and their communities when they learn about science. And for me personally, this manifested as growing up wanting to be an ecologist and understanding the environment, but rarely seeing myself and my communities um, represented in ecology and environmental science. I ultimately obtained two degrees with the word ecology in them before learning that people and the environment meant more to me than just the environment. Um, and so for so long, my learning had to focus on ecology and the environment in such a way that I couldn't see myself in my communities. And again, those social processes and historical processes that play a critical role in our understanding of the environment and our solving environmental challenges. And so infusing humanity into our science means sort of normalizing and valuing the role that our identity and our lived experiences um, can play in our work um, so that future scientists can really embody work and embody their work and feel more included in STEM and conduct research that um, is beneficial for sort of the environment and people. And so this was mentioned in my introduction, but um, for me, this kind of manifested as doing research uh, on, on rodents in Southern Africa and then having to kind of shift gears and pivot and realize that I wanted to study the drought that was going on and the communities that were being affected by it in addition to the ecological landscapes as well. <clears throat> I was able to make that shift. And, and so that's the sort of work that I do now that I aim to do with my research. And I consistently attempt to um, push back against the structures that uh, encourage us to leave people out of the equation and bring humanity in my work um, and acknowledge really these overt processes that have led to the current state of affairs. Uh, and I think this can take many forms, but is broadly aimed. Uh, and my work is aimed at linking our histories, and our identities to our current lived realities and societal conditions, um, and really the science to bring them all together and to answer questions in more robust and I think inclusive ways. Um, and so to, uh, I'll provide a little more specific examples for my research. This, this really means looking at human environment interactions with the the intersecting goals of conservation and human well being. And so I specifically prioritize research that examines social organizations, collective actions, and the efforts of local communities um, and community organizations uh, and how they are uh, acting within their areas in conservation landscapes to minimize or mitigate things like human elephant, con human elephant conflict in some contexts and human wildlife conflict in other contexts. Um, and to think about sort of how we can manage landscapes in that are important for conservation, but also important for, for human health and well being. Um, and so I think by, by actively researching these social processes that influence ecological processes and conservation outcomes, um, 
I have more of an opportunity to identify intersectional issues in my research, think critically about equity throughout the research process. Um, and it also helps me to search for solutions, I think, that benefit both people and the environment. Another way that I approach this idea of bringing humanity in my work, and I think it, it touches on a, a lot of um, some of the things that Dr. Shirazi was talking, talking about as well, um, is the importance of recognizing my positionality and, and the sources of privilege that I have when I'm doing my research. Uh, I do a lot of work in countries in Africa and Asia, as, as was mentioned in the introduction, and, and this is a, a, you know, a map that shows the countries that have been under European control and kind of just reminding us all of the, the colonial legacy that exists globally. Um, and so when I'm doing work in those places and in those contexts, I, as an American, uh, I occupy a very different positionality than I do here in the US. There I'm grappling with these legacies of oppressive colonial histories and science in particular, um, these practices of knowledge theft and really the explicit use of science to oppress at times. And so for me, bringing our humanity into, into my research means that I actively and openly acknowledge my, my privilege and, again, to some of the, the questions that were asked of Dr. Shirazi, um, the existing scientific structures that I work in, for instance, the average length of a PhD, the duration of a grant style, uh, cycle, um, or this conflict, for instance, between what a university values, publications, and what local communities values, which might be something, is often something quite different. Um, so th that these structures that I work in are not necessarily made for me to push back against these existing colonialist structures and, and the impacts of them. But at the sort of, again, at the minimum, acknowledging that to those around me, expressing that to, to local communities that I'm hoping to work with is a way for me to kind of remove the, remove the guise of complete objectivity and this idea that there, there's not this human component to the work um, and recognize the, the, the myriad of ways that my science can impact people, potentially both positively and negatively, right? And so part of my strategy with this, I know a few people were asking about sort of how you reconcile like the time frame of a postdoc to the reality that working, for instance, with indigenous communities can and should take a lot of time, right, to do it in a way that's equitable and just. Um, and so part of my strategy is to make sure my work uh, is responsive to the needs of local communities and it's not extractive, uh, is to work with organizations that already are on the ground and have had relationships with local communities have a better understanding of local needs and interests and a history of service to the community so that I can enter the space as an academic with sort of resources and, and a particular sort of skill set, um, but be of service in the work that I do. And so these are some of the organizations that I started working with or are hoping to working with, work with in an effort to strengthen the impact and the responsiveness uh, uh, and the adaptability of my research um, and really meaningfully address my positionality and, and my privilege in my work. Uh, the other way that I primarily try to push back against um, some of these legacies of oppression that are baked into the way we do science is the way that I teach and the way that I learn. So I consistently bring humanity into my work and acknowledge these processes um, as it relates to things like environmental injustice, um, oppression, and the ways that science has been used to oppress in the past. So for instance, in my, uh, I teach a course, uh, intro course on environmental studies. It's a very large intro course, 350 students. And so we have lots of opportunity to talk about, you know, ecological processes, for example, and, and um, trends in waste management or energy, right? Um, but we also have lots of opportunities to talk about, you know, justice, for example. Um, and so in, in one instance, we were teaching students uh, about some, simple statistical or relatively simple statistical approaches like regressions and chi-squared tests. And, you know, we, we paused and took time in that class to um, note the history of the statistical tests and the reality that they were used and often developed by early statisticians to promote racist ideals, right, about head size, for example, to fuel Nazi propaganda. Um, and, and really the idea with acknowledging the history of these statistical tests wasn't, you know, don't use the tests, it's math, it's usable, we, we can and should be using statistical tests, but to think about how science has been used to oppress uh, in the past and how it may continue to do so and to encourage students to um, look at those histories and then acknowledge and mitigate any potential bias or positionality that are linked to those histories when they're doing science and addressing environmental issues. 
Um, so just, just highlighting a few of, I think, the, the relevant articles uh, of interest here uh, in my efforts to kind of explicitly address this idea of justice and equity and diversity and accessibility and inclusion and belonging and responsibility and all of these related principles in STEM. Um, I've worked on several projects directly with other conservationists and environmentalists, environmentalists of color. Um, and these were all published in, in the last few years. And I think it's really worth noting that there's a growing interest in articles like these and research that is explicitly um, developing kind of usable and valuable ways of thinking about inclusion in these fields. Um, and this is obviously in direct response to George Floyd being murdered and the associated kind of civil rights and Black Lives Matter movement that have uh, encouraged all institutions everywhere, most of them, many of them, um, to think about equity in their work. And so um, I think it's, a, it's important that, that while lots of people, including myself included, have been doing this work for a very long time, there is currently an increasing interest in it as well. So um, the, really the work that underlies the, them, our aim is to listen and learn from each other while sharing our exp experiences in a way that's um, you know, inclusive and, and minimizes the sort of emotional labor involved with a broad audience. And I think this supports our overall goal, which is more inclusive and equitable science and for science to explicitly acknowledge um, the ways that it has had negative impacts in the past. Um, and so to me, this is really at the core of my research. And, and it's this idea that when we see our communities and our values in our work and in our science, we see ourselves and we are able to bring more passion, commitment and joy to our work and we can do better, more inclusive science to help us all adapt to a changing globe. We can think about ecological challenges and we can think about um, social challenges in ways that are, are much more inclusive. The other thing that I'm, I think I'm actively doing um, in the context of my research is uh, community building and professional development for students of color, uh, women in STEM through my work with, with various organizations, some of which are, are listed here. And I think, again, that's important as well. Um, the, this idea of the sort of science, scientist activist is, is important one and is something that we can all, I think, be bringing explicitly into our work. Um, yeah, I think that's the point I want to make here. <clears throat> so I might be a little under time here, so I'm happy to spend some time answering questions or talking a little bit about how I um, incorporate this into some of my research projects. But I just wanted to, to end here. The other sort of soapbox that I have is the, important, the importance of honoring the whole person. I think that there's been a history of kind of dehumanizing and removing people from, from science. And I think that's part of the reason why the, our fields are lacking in diversity and feel um, like they're lacking in, exclu in exclusivity as well. So fun facts about me to remind you that I'm a scientist and I do work on Jedi issues, but I'm also a person that does other fun things. So I have been sort of hosting some version of pub trivia for probably the last 10 ish years or so. And that's something that's important to me. I recently released a podcast called the creature connection, which is all about our connection to fictional worlds and fictional creatures. Um, and I uh, work with an organization and I'm a, a pod leader of 500 women scientists and lead lots of activities and, and, um, and fun things for that group as well. So again, just acknowledging that in the context of the research that I do, I'm thinking a lot about um, the ways in which people have been extracted from science that have led to inequities today. And so I'm very intentionally putting myself back into my science and my work. Um, so with that, I will end and take any questions. And here are just some pictures of some of us doing you know, work to uh, increase equity and inclusion and access to, to STEM work. Um, yeah, thanks. Thank you so much. That was really wonderful. Um, personally, I think I just need to thank you for doing all the work that you do. Um, you've touched on it that um, a lot of the DEIJ work kind of ends up in the hands of people of color and those who are most affected. Um, and so I think from all of us, we have to thank you for leading that cause. And I do want to just acknowledge um, that my approach to that. And so again, thinking about the structures that as an academic, right, I have to do X, Y, and Z. And so I've, I've made JEDI a core of my research field, right? I publish now. And so the university has to acknowledge it. <laughs> um, and so I think that's an important, um, it's, it's a strategy that I've taken and it definitely doesn't work for everybody, but it's, um, it's, it's a potential way of, 
balancing that reality. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so I'll get us started with a question. We do have some questions kind of um, coming in in the Q&A. Um, but first, I just wanted to ask um, about your collaborations. So you've done a lot of really great work abroad, collaborating with local scientists and the residential communities. Do you have any advice on how to approach building these collaborations as well as maintaining them, um, especially for long-term field sites? Yeah, I mean, I do think the an important component of it is, and this is sort of that tension between the time scales that all of our, you know, these structures operate, but is is the recognition that sometimes things move slowly and they they should move slowly. Um, but I think so just as a starting point is is uh, reaching out to organizations and and again sort of um, it, you know, noting the skills and background that you have, and then really asking the question, not, not even making the assumption that these skills or expertise or research experiences that I have might be relevant in, in this community, but asking if they are, right? Um, and figuring out the ways in which they might be. Because um, the reality is, right, I could come up with lots of potential research questions um, that I think are going to be interesting, but if the communities there don't care or have bias, right, there's, there's a whole sort of a number of potential, uh, or don't have buy-in rather, um, a number of potential outcomes that uh, are gonna be problematic, right? There might be less willingness to participate in research. There might be, if there's any sort of action taken uh, as it relates to like, you know, conservation or natural resource management, for example, there might be, you know, active pushback against any of that action. So again, kind of um, starting with organizations and, and the other kind of class or, or a group of people that's considered are these these boundary spanners and right people who might have a foot in academia but also have connections to organizations or also doing activism or also working with NGOs um, who can connect you with the, the right people who have better um, you know a better sense of what's what the relevant questions to be asking are or the ways in which we should be be answering or thinking about these questions. Um, so I think that's sort of the first step is really coming in with the assumption that you don't know anything because that's often the case. Um, and again, that you might have a sort of skill set that you gained from your academic and research based experiences that can be applied, but the ways in which they, they can be applied are, um, you know, potentially unknown to you. Uh, and then thinking about, okay, what is what does sustainability look like? Is there, are there ways, you know, to one of the questions that were asked, maybe um, the, the communities you're working with want to learn the specific research skills that you're, um, or the, you know, tools or field methodologies that you're working on, and maybe there can be some knowledge transfer, again, in a way that sort of thinks about building capacity and the existing local knowledge as well. Um, and then, of course, I think there's the importance of, okay, when, when something is done, when a project end date sort of comes around, what comes next, right? Are we reporting back? Are we thinking about next steps? Are we bringing communities together? Are we sharing information? Um, and again, none of that's easy to do, <laughs> um, but I think that's sort of the ideal that that's good to be aiming for. Great. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Um, so one of our first Q&A questions, um, we have an attendee who says, great talk. Could you say something about class? Many of our potential students, speaking personally, never saw anyone who looked like our non-university trained parents. Is there an important nexus in, in the interac intersection of race and class and including gender, race, and class? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and this is something that I, I think about a lot. I think class, class is so interesting because historically it hasn't come up into the conversation because it's just hard to rally around being poor, even though, right, many of us have had that lived experience and all of us probably have it um, somewhere within our family that we can relate to. Um, but it's often sort of sidelined, even though we know it's obviously very important. Uh, it's also potentially an important sort of um, rallying point for people from diverse, right, uh, so, uh, racial and ethnic backgrounds as well. And then obviously, right, it intersects with race ethnicity and, and gender and ability and sexual orientation and gender, right? right? All of these other sort of marginalized groups um, often because of these, these systemic um, issues that we face in this country are more likely to um, have less wealth. So obviously class is important. It's often overlooked and I think it's important to not do that. I also think it's really, really important when I'm doing research internationally. And again, just sort of, I occupy a specific space here as a, a woman of color in the United States. And when I go somewhere else, right? I'm definitely seen as a woman of color, but like I'm an American, right? And so that has a lot of, of sort of wealth implications associated with it. Um, so so I think it's it, there are lots of intersections that are relevant. And I think there's, uh, there's an opportunity for, I think, building 
collaborations and bringing different groups together around issues of class, particularly as it relates to natural resources, right? There are so many um, folks who, who don't have as much wealth or from lower socioeconomic status, statuses who uh, rely on the environment for their livelihoods and well being. And I think that's an important linkage. As it relates to like the academic setting, right? I don't remember the exact stat, but it is something like, I don't know, one in four professors has a a yeah, family member that has a PhD, it's something absurdly high compared to like the rest of the population. Um, and so there is this sort of uh, misrepresentation of what a professor right can look like or what an academic can look like. And I do think that's important to acknowledge that reality, um, right, especially, and it's, but again, it's hard, right? I show up in a place and people make an assumption about my, my race and gender, um, but they don't know anything about like my socioeconomic background and bringing that up in, a, in an academic setting is just a little bit weirder, right? Same thing potentially with um, with gender identity, although I think we, we've made lots of progress, for instance, asking for people's pronouns um, in, in normalizing that. Um, and, and then of course, with things like sexual orientation or, or invisible disabilities as well. Um, so I think all of these things are things that we should be explicit about sharing in ways that feel comfortable um, and in, in sort of these spaces where we're having these these discussions, I guess. So not a great answer there, but lots of thoughts. <laughs> yeah, certainly. Thank you. Uh, our next question um, asks, could you share with us how your students have responded to your teaching as you've devoted time to addressing the human and social context of science? Yeah, I think generally positively, um, I think so I my approach because there is the potential for a lot of emotional labor in this work. Um, and I think you can you can see from the number of sort of graphs and figures and data that I showed in, in my talk just now is um, is, is using data, is relying on data. And so when you see the numbers and when you can see so, for instance, in, in um, my intro environmental studies class, which again covers, you know, we have business majors and we have environmental studies majors and we have sociology majors. It's a good opportunity for people, students from across the campus really to get exposed to environmental um, topics. Uh, and so they're not necessarily, you know, coming in with, with lots of understanding of it, but we, we cover on waste management. And in that context, we also talk about environmental justice. Um, and the data on environmental justice and the disproportionate exposure of people of color and, and um, poorer people and poorer communities to things like air pollution, it's just, it's, it's kind of impossible to question it. Um, and even, and we often will um, present the data in a way that encourages them to come to the conclusion on their own, right? And so, he, you know, here's an article from science that showed this. What do you think this means, right? Um, and so it doesn't necessarily aggressively force, you know, any sort of potentially uncomfortable uh, takeaway from them. Um, although I think it's fine to do that and, and make students feel uncomfortable at times. Um, but it does sort of allow people to think through through the data as well. And so I think that just because of, to sort of protect myself from the emotional labor of having to convince a, a room full of 350 people that racism exists, right, I, I rely on the data um, to, to uh, support the conclusions, right, that there is systemic bias that has led to increased exposure of people of color to, you know, air pollution, for example. Um, and I think that approach generally lands well. Um, I think it's important that to acknowledge that, that that's my approach and it does, it does, ex it doesn't intentionally uh, incorporate other ways of knowing, right, these stories and narratives that are very important. And I do bring those up in some of my smaller classes uh, and students tend to be very receptive as well. Uh, I often think of, um, there's a science writer from the Atlantic, Ed Young, who uh, was the first person I heard say this, uh, you can't replace a feeling with a fact. And so I do think it's important for stories and, and um, emotion to be a part of the conversation as well. I just sort of choose where to infuse my personal stories or the stories of those that I know in, in places that feel a little bit more, more intimate. Um, so, but, but generally, I think with those two approaches, uh, the students are, are positive and, and receptive to it. Great. Uh, I'll actually follow up with a question. I'm curious a little bit about the demographics of UC Boulder, um, because specifically U of M is a primarily white institution. Um, so I often wonder, um, or I'm hesitant in classes when I have very few minority students about bringing these conversations up. Um, it's still definitely not a reason, probably even more of a reason to bring these conversations up. But if you have any advice on how to kind of balance the discomfort for people who are facing these issues every single day versus 
um, another part of our population that just needs to learn and be more aware? Yeah, I think that's a, it's a good question. And I, I probably don't, <laughs> I don't know if I have a great answer. Um, so in terms of demographics, this is definitely a predominantly white institution. It's also a disproportionately wealthy institution. I forget the numbers, but something like a bizarrely high percentage of the 1% of the US and their students here. Again, I mean, it's Boulder, people like the mountains, they can go skiing, right? There's lots that attracts uh, wealthy people here. Uh, um, so it's, I think, disproportionately white compared to the United States and also disproportionately wealthy. And so those are important to consider. Um, I think, again, my approach has been to sort of start by leaning on the data. Um, and then I think another approach is, so I think I generally frame the way that I look at environmental issues as us as a society really needing to center the voices of those most likely to be impacted. And often, right, those, those are people from, um, you know, people with less wealth or, or people of color, it might be indigenous communities. Um, and so there is the sort of race and class component to it. But I will bring in some other examples where it doesn't necessarily align quite as well. And I think a good example is uh, we're, we're working on wolf restoration in the state of Colorado. And when we're thinking about people who might consider themselves anti-wolf, um, it might be farmers and ranchers and from a sort of community or demographic that people might not look at me and think that I care about. But they are the ones most likely to bear the negative impacts of living on a landscape with wolves. And so their voices are really, really important in the conversation and centering them and paying attention to them, I think are quite important. Um, and so I think, um, that sort of high level goal of centering the most vulnerable can be applied to lots of different contexts, again, in a way that that might feel a bit more approachable um, for for folks from sort of a wide range of demographics. And um, that's one way of thinking about it. The other is sort of relying very heavily on the data um, to, to tell the story that might be my lived experience, but I don't necessarily have to draw on my personal background to do it. Um, but yeah, I think it takes practice and I think it, there is a level of vulnerability. The one other thing I wanted to add is we just got funding to teach an environmental racism course, which is really exciting. And, um, you know, not, not many courses are, are taught on this topic explicitly. Um, and again, it sort of touches on, on my work looking at the way that um, systems and the environmental movement as a whole have been sort of uh, oppressive to communities of color. Um, and, you know, that's going to be, there are going to be some tough conversations potentially had in that class, but the, the person who's teaching it has experience at this university with these demographics uh, teaching and has had practice kind of leading up to that. Um, so I think that's important as well. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm looking forward to integrating those in my own teaching. Uh, so our final question here is, uh, what are the current activities of the Black Ecology section in ESA at the time? Yeah, absolutely. We're um, we're sort of trying to to get back on track after I think being a little bit derailed by pandemic, which is right the, the world's experience. Um, we are currently planning something for Juneteenth, and then I think the, the probably most exciting series of activities are going to be happening at the upcoming ESA conference in Montreal. And so we'll have um, a few different panels that have been specifically organized and are are show, showcasing research by members of the, the Black Ecologist section. And then we'll have um, several events as well. We're also going to be working on a sort of uh, Black Ecologist of the Week on Twitter and on the web, web page. So we'll be <clears throat> sharing um, basically like a Google form for people who want to be featured um, to share their work, share their experiences, et cetera. And so those are kind of the, the main things. And we're also thinking about professional development, other approaches to community building. I would absolutely encourage you to, to um, connect either on the ESA website or email me directly if you'd like to learn more about all the things we've got going on. That's great. Um, so specifically for the activities you have coming up, are there ways that um, the broader community can support you and the Black ecologists? I mean, come to our panels at ESA. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and I think we're going we're gonna to have a few different events. And I think that the panels in particular, so that there's this important balance between sort of talking about our lived experiences about as, as Black ecologists, but also amplifying our research, right? We're doing lots of great research. And there's, there's also, um, th that's also an important component. So I think that's, that's important as well. I think we might be soliciting donations at some point, but I'm not sure about that. <laughs> Yeah, great. Thank you so much. Um, if you. there aren't any final questions, I think um, we can wrap up our session for today. Um, again, Dr. Bailey, thank you so much. This was a really wonderful uh, conversation. Um, also, thank you, Dr. Shirazi. Um, we've been really fortunate to have so many wonderful scientists able to, to um, present with us 
today and, and for the next or th throughout this this month. Thank you. Yeah, so please join me in thanking our speakers, Dr. Sabrina Shirazi and Dr. Karen Bailey. Um, so next Friday, we'll conclude our symposium where we'll be having an anti-racism panel discussion with Dr. Nick Rio, Dr. Robin Clark, and Dr. Katie Kamala-Mala. Um, as a reminder, if you're not already registered for the symposium, please do so, so that we have numbers that accurately reflect the amount of participation that we've had. Um, and again, we thank you all for attending and we look forward to seeing you next week. <laughs>